everybody. Welcome back to the open mic. I, of course, am Rich Eisen, and uh, this is where you come every week to hear me talk to really great, great writers about what they do. And I am thrilled with the own words today to welcome uh, one of my favorites, a great guy, great uh, writer. Many of you have, if you haven't read his books, you've certainly probably seen the TV series. Uh, Craig Johnson, the, the man behind uh, the great Walt Longmire mystery series. How are you doing this morning, Craig? I'm doing great. It's not snowing here in Wyoming, so life is good. <laughs> that, that's, that, well, that, yeah, that is good. You know, we, we here on the on the West Coast, we forget sometimes uh, uh, how the weather can be other places. You know, we, we get spoiled. So but it was thought, pretty funny because I did a, a, an interview last night or a, a little bit of a, a show last night, like with Laurie King and uh, and Lee Child. Like at and, and Lee's got a little place down, you know, in the, the southern portion of Wyoming now, like that. And, and I, I happened to ask him, I was like, well, how much time do you actually spend in Wyoming, Lee? And he's like, oh, my God, Craig, it's too cold. The winters are horrible. <laughs> I was like, didn't you know about that before yeah. you, you bought the place or was that a surprise? Like, it's so yeah. Yeah, our, our, our winters tend to, you know, kind of go in all the way through April, like and then kind of leak into May a little bit, too. And I, I always laugh about it because people will ask me that question. They say that there's an awful lot of snow in your books, you know, and, and I'm always like, you know, well, it's not the sheriff of Key West, you know, I mean, in Wyoming, we, you know, we have winter and then, you know, the 4th of July, those are our two seasons. Like, and so, you know, you just have to make up, do the best you can with what you get. There you go. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit, uh, of course, about your books. Uh, the, uh, the current Longmire book, and I know you've got another one that's going to come out later in the year, but let's talk about the one that's uh, the most current that's out right now, uh, which really touches on one of the most iconic uh, events in American history, which of course was uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn. Uh, and more specifically, some uh, artwork that claims to depict that battle. Um, tell folks about that storyline. You know, I, you, you, there are certain you know, mountains that you're gonna have to climb um, according to you know, what particular portion of the genre um, you happen to be writing in like that. And, you know, and when you're a Western mystery writer, you know, there are certain points of history, you know, that, that kind of loom large uh, in, 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 you know, in the, in the writing distance there. Like, that. And of course, where I live, you know, my ranch is right here on the Montana, Wyoming border. And so the Little Bighorn is only, you know, like about a mile, I mean, about, a, about an hour and 15 minutes, you know, rather up the road. And so, you know, I've been there, you know, I've explored, you know, the battle scene. I've, I've talked, you know, with an awful lot of Crow and Northern Cheyenne, you know, elders like who actually, you know, had great grandfathers, you know, who fought in the battles. And, uh, you know, it's very close, you know, that particular portion of American history um, to where it is that I live. And so I knew eventually I was going to, you know, probably, you know, deal with, you know, Custer and Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse and, you know, the Battle of the Little Bighorn. But the question always is, is, you know, well, how, you know, how, how do you, you know, have the, the sheriff, you know, Walt Longmire, the sheriff of the least populated county in the least populated state in America, you know, get involved with that situation? You know, can, you can't just kind of glom it in there and, you know, and see what happens. I mean, you really need an access point, you know, to make it work. And generally that access point needs to be a crime, you know, because generally you're having law enforcement involved like that. So they have to have an access point. So um, I don't know. I just, uh, for me, it was relatively easy because um, the, the painting in question, you know, that, that we're, we're discussing at this, this point in time um, is called uh, Custer's Last Fight. And it was painted by an author, uh, rather a, 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 an artist by the name of Cassili Adams out of St. Louis, Missouri. And um, it was one of these huge, you know, big, huge, uh, you know, paintings, you know, that, that they used to do these historical paintings that were, you know, like the size of like the side of a, an 18 wheel truck, you know, they, they were like, you know, 16 feet by, you know, by 10 feet, they were huge. Like at, and I guess at that point in time, what they used to do was they would tour these paintings in a wagon and charge people a quarter to come in and see the painting. And the idea being that, of course, this was a period in time before, you know, there was 24-hour news cycles and television and radio and all of these different things. <clears throat> People would go in and they would feel as if they had experienced, you know, this, this, uh, this historic moment. And so, you know, they, they toured this painting and then they brought it back to St. Louis and they didn't really know what to do with it, you know. And so what they did instead, they actually had a, an offer like at, from the guy who owned the saloon next to the train station there in St. Louis. And he said, well, I'll, I'll buy the painting. And he bought it at a bargain basement price because they really didn't know what to do with it. It was so large. 
um, and not very much in demand. Um, so the, the saloon owner took it and he put it, you know, up on the wall, you know, there in the saloon like that. And what it was, was basically a conversation piece. You know, uh, travelers would come in and, uh, you know, have a whiskey, have a beer and look up, you know, between trains like that. And, you know, and start discussing, you know, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, which at that point in time was still, you know, very current uh, history. You know, you got to keep in mind, you know, that, uh, that it was only like, you know, this is only like maybe about, you know, 20 years after the fact. So it was still, you know, very much on people's minds. Like, and it was also a, a major turning point, you know, in American history, in a sense that, you know, the the Northern Cheyenne and the Lakota and a few Arapaho actually, like, you know, fought the American military to a standstill. And so, you know, major point in American history, like that. Well, anyway, you know, people, it, it was up there for a number of years. I think all the way up through until, like, you know, I think the the 1930s, and. Um, then of course, what happens, you know, in these kind of situations is, is the the saloon went bankrupt, um, which is why it is that I have never put money into a restaurant or into a saloon because uh, it's a great way to lose your money. It seems like to me, you know, and also an awfully difficult way to make a living. I, I have all the respect in the world, you know, for bar and saloon and and restaurant owners. That's that's a that's a rough road to hoe. But anyway, this one went out of business like that, and uh, one of their largest creditors um, was a small local brewery. Uh, a local brewer by the name of Anheuser Busch, and uh, Augie Bush there in St. Louis, you know, comes down and says, you know, hey, you owe me thirty thousand dollars, you know, for all the beer, you know, what are we going to do here? Like, uh-huh. And they said, well, you know, we're bankrupt, we don't have any money, we don't have anything. And he looks up on the wall, always, you know, seeing, you know, seeing an opportunity when he saw one. He looked up on the wall, saw the big painting, Cassili Adams's painting, and said, I'll take the painting. And so they peeled it off the wall. He rolled it up under his arms like it. And he took it, you know, back up to the brewery, rolled it out on a big table in front of his marketing and publicity guys and said, we're going to make posters of this painting. And we're going to ship them out to every restaurant, every saloon, every bar in the country. And we're going to put Anheuser-Busch Brewing Company on the bottom. And by the time we're through with promoting this, we're going to be a much bigger brewer than we are right now. Well, it worked. Um, Anheuser-Busch is now, I guess, one of the largest brewers in the world. And at one point in time, they were sending out almost a million of these posters every year. Wow. And so everybody, if you if you travel anywhere in the American West, and it doesn't even have to be in the American West. I've, I've seen this poster hanging, you know, in New York, in, in a bars. I've seen it hanging, you know, in Los Angeles, like at overseas in France, in Paris, I've seen it hanging in walls, like that there's so many of them like that. And uh, um, it's just a constant, you know, you see this painting everywhere. And, and you know, the artistic credit, you know, the merit of the, the, the merits, you know, of the, of the painting, you know, are somewhat questionable. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, inaccuracies as far as uh, certainly the way that the Indians are dressed. In many ways, they look more like Zulu warriors than they do, you know, Lakota and Cheyenne warriors. Like, and, and then, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of geographic problems, you know, with it and uh, everything like that. And so it's kind of interesting, like, to kind of point out some of those things that are wrong. But that kind of became, to make a long story short, my access point um, for Walt Longmire. Because what happened was, is that after this painting had served its purpose with Anheuser-Busch, Augie Bush decided in a, in a fit of philanthropic zeal that he would give the painting to the headquarters of the 7th Cavalry, which at that point in time happened to be located um, down just outside of El Paso in Texas uh, at Fort Bliss. And one horribly velvety night, uh, the, uh, the building, you know, the, the, the officer's club and the commissary that, where, the, where they had had the big painting up on the wall caught on fire and burned to the ground and the painting was destroyed. Uh-huh. Or was it? Um, that's the whole key element, you know, to this okay. particular book. Maybe what if, what if that painting survived? You know, what if it were to survive? And I was talking to my good friends over at the Buffalo Bill Museum over in Cody <clears throat> and brought the subject up and said, well, you know, if this thing, you know, were to pop back up, you know, how much would it be worth? And I, I remember Mary, the, the, you know, the, the uh, McCracken Library, she looks at me and she goes, oh, 25, 26. And I was like, 25, $26,000. She goes, 25, $26 million, Craig. She said, that, that painting is an incredible point in social American history right. and uh, it would be worth a fortune. And I was like, well, I think I've got my MacGuffin here. I think I've got uh, the, the element that I need to start Walt off on his first art heist. And uh and that that became uh, the the, uh, the the next to last stand. Wow. 
Well, and you know, you, you touched on the what if. I mean, that is such a, the, the critical two words, I think, in all of mystery writing. What if, what if, what if. Um, I, I love that uh, as a starting point for anything in a story. Well, what if this happened? Um, tell me a little bit about the new book. What's the what if in the new book? Um, the new book, like, I mean, you know, whenever you're composing books, you know, there, there are a lot of, you know, people will ask the question, you know, how did you come to this, you know, idea like that? And, uh, you know, and how do you decide, you know, which books it is, you know, that you're going to, you're going to write. And for me, it's, it's a, it's a little bit of a unique problem. Like that in the sense that, you know, I don't know, a lot of people, a lot of readers have picked up on the fact that it takes me about, you know, um, four books to get through one year of Walt's life. Um, I tend to refer to it as the Vivaldi school. Of, of writing. It's the four seasons. Like, and, and, uh, and the reason I came to that was actually, you know, when I was discussing it with uh, my, my good buddy, uh, Tony Hillerman, you know, a long, long time ago, like at, down there in Albuquerque, we were talking and he was like on his, I don't know, 15th book. And I was like struggling with my second book, you know, and of course, any author who will be honest with you will tell you that the second book is always the most difficult book to do, because generally what happens is, is you work 15, 17 years, you know, to write a book, and you polish it and hone it down to where it needs to be. And then, you know, if you're lucky, you know, an agent picks it up, a publisher picks it up and they publish it. And then the next thing out of their mouth is, is we need another book in six months. Do you think you can knock that out? You know, well, you know, suddenly, you know, it's a whole different ball game, you know, and so it makes it a little more difficult like that. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, one of the things I decided was, is that, you know, after talking with Tony, was that, you know, you, you need to have different environs, you know, for each book, you know, and especially in the situation that I'm in, you know, with Walt, you know, working out of a small town in, you know, a very rural county, you know, in northern Wyoming, um, you know, he has to, you know, it, it would be very easy to fall into what I, I refer to the Mayberry syndrome, right. you know, where, you know, there would be a kind of a repetitious kind of quality, you know, to the formula of the books. And I really fought against that. And so one of the things, you know, Tony said was, you got to find, you know, a little bit of a, you know, a, a way of changing things up and making things different with each book. And so I thought to myself, well, what's the thing that has the largest scale effect, you know, on us, you know, here in Wyoming? And I thought, you know, it's got to be the weather, um, as we were discussing right there at the very beginning of the interview. Um, and, you know, Wyoming in January is nothing at all like Wyoming in July. And so I knew that would give me, you know, a very different kind of environment, you know, for this book. Um, and so I kind of have to pick and choose, you know, because like I can't write a, a rodeo book that takes place, you know, in January. Like, and uh, so I kind of have to be careful about that. So that will predicate, you know, what exactly the next story will be. The next one will be a social issue. You know, most generally, you know, I found that if I if a, a book is going to hold my attention, you know, for the, the nine months that it's going to take me, you know, to write it, to gestate, you know, that that book, you know, it needs to have, you know, some kind of commentary on some kind of a social issue or something that's going on mm -hmm. um, these days. And then the other one that takes, you know, a large part is, uh, is what kind of an effect is it going to have on the characters? Where are they at this particular time in their lives? And what is this case and this particular, you know, uh, issue going to take, you know, with them? And for me, this one was kind of easy. It kind of fell into place, you know, pretty easily. Like at, this was a, um, a kind of a late fall book. Um, the issue itself, you know, was uh, um, missing and murdered indigenous women, which has been a, a major issue here in Indian country. Um, it's a horrifying situation, you know, where there's so many native women like that who have been murdered or turn up missing. I mean, you know, up in Montana, you know, they make up about, I think it's, uh, you know, a full quarter. Uh, see, that. the dog agrees. See, yes. <laughs> my, my faithful they companion here. Yeah, absolutely. I've got mine sitting on the sofa right over here like that. But, uh, um, and they make up like, you know, 25% of the missing people in, you know, in Montana. And, you know, the, the number of, you know, of Native women who are killed, you know, every year. Um, is horrifying in comparison, you know, with the, uh, you know, the regular populace. Like, and then to discover that, you know, the majority of these cases of murders are done by non-native people on native lands. And so it, it was kind of an issue that I thought, you know, okay, I kind of need to, to take a crack at this. But then, then you have to find, you know, a, a vehicle, you know, something to, you know, to work with as far as that was concerned. And I had been, you know, up on the reservation, you know, with a good friend of mine, Marcus Red Thunder, who's kind of the model uh, for Henry oh, in yeah. the books. And he introduced me to a fellow by the name of Tiger Scalp Cane. And Tiger Scalp Cane was the, and is the, uh, the, uh, um, the athletic director for the high school um, there in Lame Deer. And we went up like that and there was a girls basketball game and, you know, boy, you know, girls basketball, you know, on the res 
is is kind of like the, the Battle of the Little Bighorn. If you really want to see elbows and you know uh, full contact basketball, like that that res basketball is just the place to go. And uh, and it's also you know such a uh, I think a, a solace you know for a lot of the difficulties that you find on the reservation. You know that it provides you know such a wonderful outlet you know for a lot of the the younger uh, the younger set. And so I started thinking about it and I thought, you know, maybe that, you know, would be a situation. And so what I developed was a storyline where there's a young phenom um, basketball player, uh, Jaya Long, who was actually introduced, you know, in uh, the previous book in Next to Last Stand. Um, there's a three on three basketball tournament up in Billings. And we actually get introduced to her um, and her aunt, Lolo Long, look at who is the tribal uh, police chief on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. She starts getting these death threats, you know, somebody's, you know, threatening her. And so, you know, Lolo Long contacts Walt and says, I, I think I need some help, you know, with this situation. And so, you know, Walt Longmire has found himself in some very difficult situations before, but being on a bus, you know, with an entire busload of teenage girl basketball players may be the roughest group he's ever had to go up against uh, in his entire life. Like that. So, and that'll be Daughter of the Morning Star, which will be coming out on uh, September 21st. I, I love the theme, you know, um... I, I had some relatives who grew, who grew up in South Dakota and, and uh, uh, some in Montana. And, and uh, as I've noted to you before, uh, my mom uh, was born and raised uh, in Banner, which is right by Sheridan, which is only about 20 minutes from uh, maybe 30 minutes from where you're at. Um, and I think that's one of those things a lot of people don't know is that uh, how popular basketball is in oh. uh, native culture. Um, it, I don't know why it would seem so counterintuitive, but it is, you know, <laughs> you don't think of it, of this indoor sport being so popular, but uh, it really is, isn't it? It really is. I mean, I think there are a number of things I think that work, you know, it's benefit like that. First of all, I mean, you know, with baseball and football and things like that, you know, the amount of equipment that you need, you know, you need a lot of um, money you know, to support that type of, you know, of, uh, of athletic activity, like it. And on the res, sometimes, you know, that's, that's a difficulty like that because their, their budgets are strained like that. And so, I mean, with basketball, you need a good pair of shoes, like at a ball, basically what you need, like it. And uh, everywhere you go, there's going to be a hoop, you know, up on the side of like a, you know, a little one, you know, two bedroom house, um, you know, and a dirt, you know, court like that, where, you know, there you'll see those kids out there playing. And then there's a fluidity, I think, to the game that really appeals um, I think to the native uh, sensibility um, that there's just a constant movement to it like that. And, and in many ways, you know, it's, it's almost a dance, you know, which is uh, such a large uh, aspect of, you know, their society. And, you know, in many ways, like at that, that comes to, to, to the fore um, in this particular book, like uh, there's a lot of dance, like uh, you know, and a lot of that movement that goes on, and and then and just about the entire book takes place, you know, up on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, which was great for me because it gave me an excuse to go up and spend time with all my friends and neighbors and practically family, you know, up there, like uh, right. in a in a, kind of, in a kind of a difficult period in time. I mean, with COVID going on and all of that, you know, I think everybody feels a little isolated, and I think that you know the way um, that COVID has really hit hard. Um, and a lot of the reservations, it's made it even more difficult for them. So to just, you know, be able to go up and check on them and make sure that they were okay and, and just spend time, you know, with my friends, you know, and, and it's, it's another world, you know, I, 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 I never have to worry about going, you know, to some far flung, you know, part of the world, you know, it, it's a whole nother world just right across the border up there in Montana, which is just right. spectacular. Well, you, you know, you mentioned Tony Hillerman, who's also one of my very favorite authors. And uh, one of the things that I, I, uh, uh, loved about his uh, Navajo Tribal Police series so much was uh, it was so clear that he invested so much time and energy into getting the the mythologies right not just but not just the mythologies the daily life what it's like in the modern day res and I read that you know he he you know spent a lot of time uh, years learning all that and just becoming part of that community in New Mexico before he ever even started writing those books. It's one of the things I really like about your books too. It's so clear that you also have a deep respect for native culture and for, for uh, making sure that these characters are very three dimensional. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't be odd, but let's face it in the history of writing the, you know, Western stories that, you know, a lot of times native Americans are not portrayed so three-dimensionally 
uh, please expound on that a little bit about uh, how you uh, approach writing these characters and, and your thought process and how, and, and of course not just the native uh, characters, but how you have them intermingle with, the, with your non-native characters. Well, it's a passion, I think, first off. Like I think you have to have a passion and an appreciation. Um, and, and I think that those are the two powerful tools that will lead you, you know, pretty unerringly, you know, down that road. I mean, that's the thing is, is that, you know, I mean, you know, in, in times and periods, you know, where sometimes, you know, authors can get, you know, um, criticized for, you know, uh, you know, social appropriation and that type of thing. Um, you, you have to make sure you get it right. You really, really do. Like, I mean, these are a people, like these are a culture, a society, like at a, a, a nation, you know, unto themselves. Like, at, and if you're going to include them in the books, you know, you really have to make sure that you treat them with the respect, you know, that they deserve. Um, they're just such spectacular people like that. And there's a lot, there's a lot to learn. Um, and there's a lot to try. I mean, it's, it's, gonna, it's a lifetime achievement, you know, to try um, and, and, and try and get them and get them right. And, you know, one of the, the things I love and one of the things I'm very, very proud of is the fact that, you know, that the, you know, the books and the television show are extraordinarily popular um, up on the res, you know, up on, on what I consider to be my res, you know, the Northern Cheyenne and the Crow Reservations. Um, and to the point where, you know, whenever I first started out and I was doing all that research and spending all that time with everyone up there, um, you know, I, I finally got to the point where, you know, it, one of my favorite quotes about writing is the one from Wallace Stegner, where he says, the greatest piece of fiction ever written is the disclaimer at the beginning of every book that says nobody in this book is based off anybody alive or dead. And what a crock that is. You know, I mean, that's what you do. You go out and find interesting people and populate your novels with them. And, you know, I'm no different you know, than any other. Like, well, the problem with that, of course, is, is that I write in Wyoming. Like, and so there's only half a million people in Wyoming. So whenever I stick somebody in my books, every Everybody knows who I'm talking about. And it's even worse up on the Northern Cheyenne and the Crow Reservation because, you know, they're about, you know, like 5,000 enrolled members up there. And so everybody knows who I'm talking about when I put Lonnie Littlebird in the books or I talk about Henry or Dina Minicamps or Lolo Long or all of the other characters. They all know who, who I'm talking about. And nine times out of 10, I don't even bother changing the names anymore. I just go ahead, you know, I'll ask, you know, I'll say, hey, you know, you're in this book. You didn't kill anybody or anything like that. Do you mind <laughs> if I go ahead and use your name? And their immediate response is, absolutely. Are you kidding me? I want to buy copies and give them to all my friends and show them what a celebrity I am, for goodness sake. And so that's kind of reassuring like that, you know, whenever yeah. you're, you know, writing outside your realm like that. But uh, then again, I've got a little bit of an advantage in the sense that, you know, I, the, the protagonist in my books, you know, the character that I write, you know, he's a white guy. He's a white sheriff like that. And um, that gives me an opportunity an awful lot of the time, even as knowledgeable as Walt is um, in that world. He's not completely infallible and totally knowledgeable, um, which, you know, gives, you know, Henry the opportunity to kind of like, teach Walt as we go along. And then, you know, in the long run, it also is an opportunity to teach the readers who are, you know, I mean, the books are translated in about 20 different languages all over the world and, and, and reach all points, you know, the globe and all over the country here, you know, to teach them about these incredible people, you know, that live just a little bit north of me. And uh, it's just, you know, it would be, I, I hate using the term because it's a terrible pun, but it would be criminal for me to not include them in my books. Um, Whenever I'm reading, you know, books that take place in my part of the world, and and there aren't any natives in there, I'm like, well, what did you do with them? Where, you know, <laughs> what, what part of my world are you in? You know, because you know they, they become such a large part, you know, of, of who I am and where I am and, and the place that I live. I I don't think I could tolerate, you know, dropping them out. That's important to me. I mean, as few enough ethnicities as there are you know, on the high plains. I try and utilize as many of them as I possibly can. I mean, you know, the natives are, you know, omnipresent, you know, in the books. Like, but then there are also others. I mean, you know, whenever I put the Basque culture, you know, in my books, you know, I, I had to laugh because the books got translated, you know, into French and into Spanish. And we were actually in that Pyrenees region of the Basque portion, you know, the frontier there and doing a, a book uh, event in Bayonne. And uh, the first question, you know, that they all had for me was, there are Basques in Wyoming? And I was like, did you guys lose them or what? Yeah, there are a lot of Basques in Wyoming. So well, Craig, let me follow up on that because, you know, I was going to ask you. And so uh, I read, you know, when A&E uh, dropped the show before it went to Netflix, one of their, their main thing was they felt the demographic for the show was, was too old, essentially. And I found that so surprising because 
stories of the West are so enduring. Um, and, and, you know, well, maybe not in the way they were in the 30s, 40s, 50s, they're still incredibly popular across a, a huge swath of the culture. And I wonder if, first of all, I wonder, you know, what your thought is on this, but I wonder if some of it is because modern day Western writers like yourself do include so uh, well and so thoroughly the fact that there were many cultures that were part of the Western environment, not just, you know, white Europeans and Native Americans. They, you know, that there were, you know, Mexicans and Spaniards and Basque and uh, on and on and on, you know, it, 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 do you think that's part of it? And, or, or, you know, what do you, why do you, what do you think is the, the thing that makes this such an enduringly popular theme? Well, I think that, you know, the, the re readers are a lot shrewder, you know, you know, than they used to be. Like, you know, there were a lot of readers that just, and there are still a lot of readers that just read for the entertainment value. But, you know, the, the BS meter, you know, on an awful lot of readers nowadays is they'll, they can tell pretty quick if you're kind of making things up, you know, and it's kind of disingenuous, you know, for you to do that to them like that, you know, you really have to try and, and search for a truth. You know, and that's the truth is that there were, you know, multifaceted, you know, uh, cultures and societies that made up the American West. And that's kind of, you know, important to make sure that you get that across and also makes for much more interesting books, you know, makes for much more interesting characters, a much more varied experience, not only in the writing like that, but also in the reading. Um, now to go back, I have to jump back real quick here. Um, yeah, that it, it, talking about the BS meter, like it, you know, that was A and E's excuse. You know, whenever it is that they decided to drop Longmire, what actually had happened was, is it was the highest rated scripted drama that they had ever had in their history as a network. And so they went to Netflix. I mean, not to Netflix, but they went to uh, Warner Brothers and said, "We want to buy Longmire because you know a, a network can make a lot more money off of a show if they own it." you know, rather than just licensing it from a studio. Well, you know, Warner Brothers looked at him and said, you know, we're the highest rated scripted drama you've ever had. Why would we sell ourselves to you? And A&E in their infinite knowledge at that point in time and, and uh, intelligence said, you know, well, if you don't sell it to us, we're gonna cancel it. And Warner said, well, you're gonna look kind of funny canceling the highest rated scripted drama you ever had. And what I learned in my experiences with Hollywood is never try and underestimate the intelligence of television executives. You can't <laughs> dig that low. So they did. So to cut off their nose, despite their face, you know, they canceled Longmire. Well, there was this major uproar right in campaigns and they lost like 30% of their network audience. And so they had to come up with a spin really quick, you know, to try and save face. Like, and so they said, oh, well, it's cause the demographic was too old. That's what it was. So again, and well, you know, we were fortunate, you know, in that um, that was the point in time when there was this, uh, this little uh, streaming company that was coming up. And I remember talking to uh, Peter Roth, you know, at, uh, at Warner Brothers. And I said, well, Peter, are we going to get picked up again? I mean, we were a successful TV show. And he goes, oh, yeah, we're going to get picked up again. And I said, well, where do you think we're going to end up? And he goes, well, I think we're going to end up with this streaming service. You have to remember, this is back at the very beginning when streaming services were just starting. And I said, well, what's that mean? And he goes, oh, it's where you can watch, you know, a TV show on your phone and on your computer. And I was like, oh, that's it. We're dead. You know, we're dead. We're never going to be heard from again. Well, that was Netflix, you know, so who's become like the biggest producer, you know, towering over top of all of the studios there in Hollywood. Like, and, uh, and we're actually still one of the top 10 um, you know, original programming, you know, shows on Netflix three years after they went to Warner Brothers after three years of production, went to Warner Brothers and said, we want to buy Longmire. Like, and, uh, you know, once again, Warner said, no, we're not going to sell it to you. Like, and they were a little bit, you know, they were a little bit better than, than A&E. They said, well, we're going to finish up after three years and stop production. Like, well, that was three years ago and we're still one of the top 10, you know, original com, com, original content um, shows on Netflix. And so I, I don't know when we're going to be off of Netflix anytime soon. But uh, but yeah, we seem to be, you know, uh, you know, chugging right along. Well, I'm grateful for it because uh, I, I enjoy the show and I can absolutely assure you I have uh, I have relatives in Casper who tell me they did not miss a single episode. So um, and they uh, forgive you for 
it being actually shot in New Mexico instead of Wyoming. <laughs> I can usually shut that down. Generally, when everybody in Wyoming says, you know, why didn't they film it in Wyoming? And I'm always like, they start filming in February. Yeah, there, there you go. So unless you, you wanted it to look like Nome, Alaska, which just wasn't going to work. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I, did, I, I only have two other questions for you, but the, fir the first one is um, the Walt Longmire of the TV show and the Walt Longmire of the books is is pretty much the same with what I would think is one notable uh, difference and that the, the Walt Longmire that you write has much more of a sense of humor, uh, <laughs> a visible sense of humor. Uh, you know, the Robert Taylor's Walt Longmire is a little more laconic, a little more reserved, um, a little more stoic, you know, maybe is that, was that something that the, the TV guys said, we need this because it's more of the classic thing or, you know, how, what, what's your thought and do, and do readers go, Hey, when they, if they come to the, to the books after they've seen the TV series, do they go, well, I did, that's weird. Well, it's different or something. Do you, know, what, do you ever run into that? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like, and that's generally, I mean, there, there are a couple of major differences like that, you know, that, uh, that, that, you know, where Walt, you know, the, Walt, the two Walts kind of, you know, part company like that. The one being that the Walt in the books is obviously a little bit older, you know, than, mm -hmm. uh, than Robert Taylor. Um, you know, but uh, I mean, that was the, one of the first things, you know, that they, 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 uh, the producers said to me, they said, you know, well, we think we're going to make Walt and Henry a little bit, you know, younger than they are in the books, you know, and I had the redneck cowboy, you know, author response where I was like, well, now why are we doing that? And they said, well, because we'd like the show to run for about 10 years. And at the end of the run, we'd rather not have them on walkers. You know, by the time <laughs> we're so I had a hard time arguing that point with them. Like, um, another one is, is that, you know, Walt is actually, believe it or not, bigger um, in the books. You know, um, Robert Taylor's about six foot three, you know, and he's a pretty good sized guy. By Hollywood standards, he's a giant. Um, and so I was tickled to death, you know, to get him. Um, but in the books, Walt is like six foot five and weighs something like 255 pounds. I mean, he was an offensive lineman for USC. He was a Marine investigator. I mean, he's just, I think I've referred to him before as a refrigerator with a head, yeah. um, is the way I've, you know, I've described him. Like, and then the last one, of course, is the one that you just mentioned, um, the sense of humor. Um, for me, humor is just, it's just lock, stock and trade. Like it, it, it's part of the deal. Um, every time I try and write a serious scene, you know, there are going to be four or five, you know, comic remarks like that, that are going to come up. I just don't have any control over that. You know, I can usually weed out about a third of them like that, but you know, there's, there's two thirds of them that are going to make it back in there. Um, and also, you know, the, the thing that I've noticed, you know, I, I just got finished doing the, uh, um, the, the, uh, sheriff and uh, chiefs of police association meeting down in Casper for the state of Wyoming like that. And, uh, consistently, you know, what law enforcement tells me when they read the books is they, they, they really love the books, you know, for the procedural aspects and there's an honesty to them. Um, but one of the things they really love is the humor. They really, really love the humor. Yeah. Um, whenever you're in that kind of a job, whenever you're in that kind of a situation, and that can be anything, anybody, you can be a teacher, you can be in medicine, um, you can be in law enforcement, whatever, like that. If you're, you're facing a difficult situation, one of the ways you get through that to get to the end of the day is by having a sense of humor. Right. Um, it'll protect you better than a bulletproof vest will um, well, on a yes. daily basis, yes. you know? Yes. And so for me, the humor kind of became an essential part of it like that. And as far as like the departure um, with the television show, when we were on A&E, it was basic cable. You know, it was a basic cable television show with, you know, commercials, you know, 15 minute increments and the entire show itself was 45 minutes long. And so anything that didn't have to do absolutely with the plot of that particular episode got chucked out. Um, it was interesting for me because I would read the scripts, you know, that they were doing. Um, they would have like a room full of writers, you know, along with the producers, and they would write a script and then they would send it to me so that I could go through and say, yeah, no, you can't drive down to Denver in two hours. No, look at, you know, you're, you know, you know, no, Walt has no jurisdiction on the, you know, on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. No, if a body were to flow along in the Powder River, it can't go south. It would have to swim against the current. It would have to go north and little <laughs> things like that, you know, but uh, there was also a ton of humor. There was a lot more humor in the scripts than actually made it into the show which was, you know, for me, a little bit heartbreaking like that. But, uh, you know, that was one of the problems that you face, you know, as far as like basic cable television was concerned, that you had to get the story in, you know, you had to tell the plot. And I think what happened was, is that it was such a success those first three years. Um, the producers really didn't want to reinvent the wheel 
um, whenever we made the jump, you know, over to Netflix. There were some changes that they made, but the general tone and everything, they wanted to keep it, you know, the way it was because it had been such a success. Yeah, well, I guess that's understandable. Well, I, I only have one other question for you. It's uh, my, my standard closing question. I, I like to, to end on what I hope is a fun note. I mean for it to be a fun note. Uh, and also maybe a little challenging for you. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Um, let us say that I had the magical power to put you together uh, for a, a drink and a conversation with any one of the following three people, who would you choose and why? And the options I'm going to give you are uh, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, uh, the great Lakota warrior Crazy Horse, or Martha Jane Canary, who most of us know better as Calamity Jane. I'm not all Western for you. Of those three, I could put you together with one of them. Who would you choose and why? Gotta be Crazy Horse. Gotta be Crazy Horse. Um, for so many reasons. Like, you know, I mean, he, you know, talk about a Renaissance man. I mean, he was, you know, a philosopher, a shaman, a warrior, a storyteller, you know, all of these things like that. And, you know, there isn't even a photograph of him. Um, there's, there's so little, you know, that we know. Um, but, you know, just uh, so many facets to the man, you know, that, that I would, you know, like to, you know, to hear about like that and just see, you know, what he was like as a human being, because, you know, as far as, you know, being an incredible and multifaceted individual, you know, he'd have to be right there at the top of the list, you know, just uh, for so many different reasons like that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he'd have to be the one. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm not surprised. Thank you. And I'm, I'm <laughs> thrilled at that. that. That makes me happy. Um, Craig, thank you again. Uh, if anyone out there is watching this, if you haven't seen either the TV series or read the books, what are you waiting for? We're burning daylight here. Get to it. I highly recommend them. Uh, Craig, the only thing that uh, you are better at as a writer is, is uh, being a gracious a person and a, and a fabulous interview. And I, I really appreciate uh, your time today. I, I, I think I'm gonna speak for everybody in, in saying thank you for, uh, for sharing all this with us today. Oh, my pleasure, Rich, anytime. Great, well, hey, I may, I may hold you to that. No problem, happy <laughs> to <right>. do it. <laughs> and for uh, those of you out there, if this was enjoyable, uh, hit the subscribe button. And because uh, I got folks coming all the time uh, who are uh, more than happy to share their insights and stories about their work. So. Uh, for myself, Rich Eisen, for Craig Johnson today, for my dog, Stella, who was over here and made an appearance earlier, uh, un unwarranted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see you on the next go around. Take care.